presentation of this course, new course. And today we have Daniel T. Muñoz, who was a long time ago the former organizer of SIPA, and he is again because he's back. And he will talk about the use of security in popular activity. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, well, uh, it's an honor for me to to open this uh, academic year for Simba. I could say it's a, a great uh, initiative uh, which has worked very well and to my colleagues. And I am really grateful uh, to them uh, for accepting me again uh, in the organization. Uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy this seminar and I encourage you to participate. Uh, well, I'm going to, to talk uh, about uh, as Pao said, uh, the use of skew braces in pop theory. theory. Uh, rather than my own work or my own results, uh, my idea is to present a survey of some of uh, the some of the main uh, research uh, topics I am interested in. Uh, namely, uh, as you may see from the title, no, it does not work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, it, now it, it moved. No, no. Yeah, it did. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, uh, as you may see from the title, there are two, two topics here. On the one hand, we have Pokalwa theory. Uh, um, uh, uh, roughly speaking, this is a generalization of Galois theory uh, with both algebras. In Galois theory, there is the notion of Galois extension. So an extension of fields, we, uh, for an extension of fields, we define what means to be Galois. And to such extensions, we attach uh, a group, in Hopgal, which is the Galois group. In Galois theory, uh, we have a notion of all Galois extension, and we attach to them a cos algebra together with an action, a linear action of this cos algebra on the top field. This is what we call a Hopgalois structure. Not just any pair, but uh, in such a way that uh, we generalize the notion of uh, Galois extension. Every Galois extension is Hopgalois, but not the other way around. On the other hand, we have uh, skew braces, um, and these are algebraic objects. Uh, with a definition that may remember to the, the one of a ring. Uh, it is a set uh, together with uh, two operations, such that uh, it is a group with respect to both. And there is uh, what, what we can uh, think of a twisted distributive property relating these two operations. It looks like a distributive property, but there is some twist. We will see uh, how this is uh, defined. Um, well, these are apparently uh, two different topics, uh, and they are indeed, but as when you are uh, reading a thriller or watching a film, when there are two parallel stories, they eventually connect. This is what is going to happen here. Thanks. Um, there, uh, these, these two lines uh, eventually will be connected, and we will see that Hoc-Galois structures on Galois extensions correspond to a certain class of skew braces. So this is what we are going to see in this talk. Uh, we will see both topics, first hoc theory, then skew braces, and finally how they are related. Okay. So uh, I will start with Galois theory, but the starting point will, will be Galois theory. Let me first recall some uh, notions. Uh, first, uh, a field extension is Galois if it is normal and separable. If you don't remember what this exactly, each of these terms exactly mean, mm, don't worry. Uh, just, uh, well, uh, let me say that uh, when an extension is Galois, a uh, uh, morphism of fields from the field L to an algebraic closure is injected if and only if it is bijective. 
here the uh, well this this is the property that it is a k-automorphism of L. It is an automorphism of L that fixes all the elements of K. And the Galois group uh, in, in this case, the Galois group of the extension is defined as its uh, group of k automorphisms, the group of k automorphisms of L. Uh, and well, this makes sense even if the extension is not Galois, but from what we have seen, when the extension is Galois, its Galois group is the set of all its k embeddings in an algebraic closure. Um, well, the uh, perhaps the main utility, the main purpose of this is that the Galois group encodes algebraic information of the section. Perhaps the main phenomenon illustrating this is the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, which states that the subgroups of the Galois group correspond bijectively to the intermediate fields of the extension. So we can translate the study of the intermediate fields to group theory. Uh, all right, uh, then uh, how, how uh, now let us see how we can motivate uh, this uh, hoc Galois theory. And um, what I will show is that we can uh, reformulate uh, the definition of Galois extension, giving an, give an equivalent definition so that hoc algebras arise somehow. Um, well, first, um, well, let me say that all extensions in this talk will be finite. Sometimes I will mention it explicitly, sometimes not. Um, a finite Galois extension is characterized on the one hand from uh, the k-group algebra of G, which is this set. This, of, of course, makes sense for every finite group. The k-algebra of the, the k-group algebra of G is the set of linear combinations of elements in G with the scalars in K. And this is, of course, a K vector space. And on the other hand, we have uh, its action, or the, the action of K of G on L, which is defined as uh, uh, evaluating, uh, recall that the elements of G are K automorphisms of L, so we evaluate them on an element Y in L, and carry out the corresponding linear combination. Uh, so that we have, uh, we can say, a uh, linear map uh, from K of G tensor L to L. Uh, well, uh, what means, uh, I said that this can be characterized from these two stuff. This, uh, what I mean is, is that we have this characterization. For a finite and separable extension, the lower k, this extension is Galois if and only this map j is uh, a k-linear isomorphism. In general, it is k-linear, so the, the characterization is that this map is bijective. Um, well, on the one hand, uh, how does this work? Um, so, as I said, the elements of g are automorphisms. When we consider linear combinations, we lose bijectivity, but they are still endomorphisms. So we can see naturally K of G uh, embedded in the space of K endomorphisms of L. And tensoring by L means that now we consider scalars not only in K, but in the whole of L. Um, and we evaluate uh, the, the arising elements. Uh, um, we consider the arising elements as endomorphisms as defined above. Uh, so what this result means is that uh, L over K is Galois exactly in the cases where this assignation uh, parameterizes the whole of the K endomorphisms of L. And this is a characterization of the Galois condition for our extension L over K. Now, uh, the remark is that uh, this K of G uh, is the, the K group algebra is a hop algebra. At this point, let me also say that if you don't know what a hop algebra is, there's absolutely no problem. Uh, we can just keep in mind that it is a vector space with some additional structure. Uh, for instance, there is algebra structure, an internal product, uh, which is compatible with the product of escalars. The dual of this structure, which, which is what we call the co-algebra structure, 
there are some compatibility relation between both of these two. This is the definition of phi algebra and also a uh, compatible anti-automorphism, which we call co-inverse. A vector space with more stuff, uh, essentially. Um, um, well, in our uh, if in addition, we have a Hopf algebra acting on, on, a, uh, on the top field of an extension, uh, a Hopf algebra is acting on L, we will say that L is an H module algebra with respect to that action. I mean, when I say um, uh, acting on L, uh, what I mean is that there is a linear map from H tensor L to L in the same way. So we say that L is an H module algebra when L is an H module. And in addition, uh, there are some uh, compatibility between the, the action with uh, and the pop algebra operations of H. We impose, impose more compatibility relations. And in our situation, we have that K of G is uh, a pop algebra. And with respect to the classical action, L is a K of G module algebra. So <clears throat> now what we are going to do is in this situation, abstract these properties and replace uh, a of G by a pop algebra uh, uh, acting on, on the top field of the section. And this is how the notion of focal by extension arises. It is a finite extension for which there is some uh, a pop algebra H and a linear action, i.e. a map, a linear map from H tensor L to L, such that on the one hand, L is an H module algebra with respect to that action, and on the other hand, the corresponding map J, which is completely similar to the previous one, is bijective. Here we, uh, now we consider H, which acts linearly on L, and this action uh, allows to embed H in the K endomorphism. So it is exactly the same idea. And hence we have this other map J. And in, in that case, we will say that the pair of H and the action is a Hopf-Galois structure on the extension. So in other words, we can define what a Hopf-Galois structure on an extension is and say that an extension is Hopf-Galois if it admits some Hopf-Galois structure. And this is the way we uh, generalize the notion of Galois extension. This is indeed a generalization because uh, every Galois extension is for Galois. This follows uh, directly from the, the development uh, that we have seen. Let us see. Uh, if we consider a Galois extension with group G, L over K, then uh, we choose K of G, uh, the K group algebra of its Galois group, together with uh, the, the, its classical action on L, the one we have seen two slides ago, and from the characterization that we saw, since the extension is Galois, the corresponding map J is bijective. This is by construction. So uh, K of G together with the classical action is a Hopf-Galois structure on the extension, and hence it is Hopf-Galois. Um, well, with the tools we have now, we are not able to check the following facts. So at this point, you have to believe me. Uh, the extension Q of the Q root of two over Q uh, is not Galois. Perhaps it's the prototypical example of extension that is not Galois, but it is not Galois. Um, it can be checked that it admits a unique of Galois structure. Uh, but if uh, to this extension we attach uh, a primitive third root of the unity, then we obtain a Galois extension. The, uh, this is the normal closure. Uh, the, or we can say the Galois closure of the previous one. Uh, and since it is Galois, it is Hopf Galois. Uh, and in this case, we can check that it admits five Hopf Galois structures. So, as you may see, uh, uh, there, there might be several uh, different Hopf Galois structures on the same extension. And in fact, this is the most usual situation. Um, <coughs> Even if the extension is Galois, if the extension is Galois, there is 
the one that we have saw, which is called the classical Galois structures, the classical Galois structure, but there might be others. Um, well, on the other hand, also there are extensions that are not uh, Hoccalois. For instance, if we attach to the rationals, a root of the polynomial gets to the five minus x minus one. And this is because uh, this polynomial is not solvable by radicals. There is some more general result uh, giving account of this uh, relation. Uh, well, yeah, this is all I, I wanted to uh, say to, in order to introduce Cochrane theory. And at this point, let us move on to the next topic of this talk, which is uh, the one of the steel braces. But I will start uh, by, um, by talking uh, about the high historical motivation that led to the introduction and the study, the, the study of the skew braces, which is the Jan Baxter equation. Uh, this is a consistency of, uh, equation that uh, appears mostly in mathematical physics. Uh, if, if you search it in Wikipedia, it is uh, present is as uh, it is introduced as a consistency equation appearing in the fields of mechanical statistics. Um, well, the idea is that uh, the study of skew braces is useful to uh, calculate solutions of uh, this equation. But before, uh, well, let, let me state what a solution of the of the equation is. If we have v a vector space. A solution of the Jan Baxter equation is defined as a map from V tensor V to itself, satisfying this relation. Here, R12 means that we have uh, we have R in the first two components, which is uh, a map from V tensor V and the identity in the third one. This is a map from V uh, tensor to times. Itself. And R23 is the same, but R in the in the last two components. And uh, the, the condition for this uh, map to be a solution is that these two uh, uh, these two compositions of maps uh, are equal. Uh, but we mathematicians, pure mathematicians, are interested in set theoretic solutions, the Jan Baxter equation, which which has an analogous definition, but instead of vector spaces, we consider just sets and the Cartesian product of a set X by itself. And you can find also illustrations of the Young Baxter equations uh, on the Young Baxter equation uh, in terms of uh, not theory. And well, as I said, skew races were introduced because thanks to them, we can construct set theoretic solutions of the Young Baxter equation. This was, uh, uh, these objects were originally introduced by Ron in 2007 in a particular case, and by Wamiria Benjamin uh, 10 years later in all its general, in all their generality. And a skew left brace is a non empty set B together with two operations, two binary operations on B, both of which endow B with group structure and moreover for. Each element A, B, and C in capital B, there is this relation, which, as I said at the beginning, looks like a distributive property, but the element A that is multiplying with the operation circle to the other two in the other member appears here, here between A circle B and A circle C. We have the inverse of A with respect to the first group structure. This is what this notation means. Um, when the first group structure is abelian, B is simply called a brace. In fact, this, this was uh, the, the original definition by Brom. Um, well, uh, some terminology, the, the, group, the first group structure is called the additive group of the brace. The other one is called the multiplicative group of the brace. The size of the, well, the skew brace is the number, the cardinality of the set B, of the underlying set. Um, well, this is the definition of skew left brace, because the element A is multiplying on the left. We define similarly skew right braces, 
and the ones that satisfy both properties are just two-sided securities. And um, well, before uh, Paul, uh, continuing with the, the main purpose of the talk, let me explain uh, how uh, we can construct set theoretic solutions of, uh, uh, of the Jan Baxter equation from a uh, skew breaks. So, if we have a skew breaks, its gamma function is defined as the map from B to the automorphisms of B, like this. Uh, we take an element small a in capital B, and its image is the automorphism of B defined like this. It hits an element small b in capital B to give the inverse of a with respect to star, star a circle b. This is the, the definition. And uh, this function turns out uh, to be bijective. And thanks to this, uh, for a skew race, the multiplicative group is uh, completely determined by the additive group because we can multiply by A with respect to the operation star at both sides and obtain this equality. Well, it was found by Rom in 2007 for braces and by Guarnieri and Benjamin 10 years later for skew braces that uh, how to construct a theoretic solution uh, of the Jan Baxter equation. For, for a skew race. If this uh, skew left race, uh, we can define a map from B times B to B times B, like this, using the, the two operations and the gamma function of the skew race. Uh, and well, now let me move on how we connect uh, both of these uh, topics. And this will be, uh, yeah. So, but then if we have uh, the only thing that you ask for gamma when you want to re recover the race is that it's really active. no, uh, but for every element in B, the automatism is ejected. For every element in B, the uh, map A is rejected. What you ask for gamma. Um, this map, you mean the, mm -hmm. the map gamma from B to the automorphisms of B is bijected. What you ask, I mean, uh, you say that you can forget the mm -hmm. circle and get it from the gamma. Mm -hmm. But does the gamma well, have some property or not? That, 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 that is only the question. The probably, but uh, normally the, the, the way it, it works is that from a group, uh, from, from any group, B star, you can see how to define a skew brace uh, so that you construct in a bijective way, the function gamma. Yeah, from the trace and get the gamma, it's okay. But from the gamma, and get the, the circle. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the gamma is probably the Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean because the, the circle appears in the definition of gamma. And I. Uh, I think that there, that there is uh, some some extra properties that are used for that. Uh, okay, I, I I will check it. Thanks, thanks for the reminder. Okay. So the gamma function is a ladder. Mm -hmm. The gamma function. Yeah. We have some condition to say that something is a gamma function. Yeah. Uh, okay. But uh, it's not uh, it's not easy to explain what is the condition. Uh, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> let me uh, let me explain. Well, this connection, as I said, will be carried out uh, by means of correspondence results. I said at the beginning, all the structures on the extensions correspond to skew braces. Well, we will see how this works. Uh, but well, this perhaps. One can see as a starting point while wondering the following question. For a separable Hopka law extension, how many uh, how many Hopka law structures uh, can we find on the lower page? Can we describe them, at least count them? And Greit Aparaitis theorem provides a complete answer uh, for all separable uh, extensions, but we will see it only for Galois extensions. Just for simplicity. So if a lowercase a extension with group G 
Well, we consider a regular left translation from G to the permutations of G just by multiplying on the left side by each element of, on G. This is uh, behind the philosophy of the Kyle Kyle Hamilton theorem that each finite group can be embedded in a permutation group. Um, well, this map is injective, so we can see G as a subgroup of the group of permutations of G. In particular, we can let G act on the permutation by conjugation. Uh, what I mean is that uh, if G acts on a permutation eta, small g, then we conjugate eta by the image of G by lambda. This is another permutation. Uh, what Greit Amaraidis theorem states is that there is a bijective correspondence between uh, between the Hopgalois structures on our Galois extension and lower k and the subgroups of the group of permutations of G that are regular and G established. Let me explain what, what both of these things mean. Uh, a subgroup of the group of permutations is regular if this is satisfied for each part. Uh, of elements of G, there is a unique eta in N carrying one element to the other. Uh, this N, recall, is a, set, uh, is a set of permutations of G, so it acts on elements of G, just as a permutation. So this condition means that the action of, on, of N on G is simply transitive. It is transitive. But in addition, the element that exists for each pair for, for each pair is unique. This is what simply transitivity means for a group action. And on the other hand, GS double mean that the action of, of G on the permutations, as we have seen before by conjugation, is close to N. We let elements of N be conjugated by elements of lambda of G and obtain another element of N. Then, uh, Greit Aparagi's theorem states that Hokkaido structures on a Galois extension can be labeled uniquely in terms of uh, a class of subgroups of the group of permutations of G, namely those that are simultaneously regular and G estable. Uh, so it reduces, it translates the problem to group theory, which is generally uh, easier, much, much more manageable. And moreover, <laughs> So, sorry. So close here means uh, that the orbit is inside the So it is on n and are inside the no? Um uh, uh, you mean yes yes, table? Yes, this table. The orbit is nothing in topology. Uh no, no, not in topological sense. Yeah, what, what I mean is that yeah, the orbit of uh, of an ash, uh, the orbit of an element of n remains in n. And is invariant by the action. And um, since we attach a group to each Hochelois structure, we can define the type of a Hochelois structure as the isomorphism class of the group to which it corresponds among the groups of the same order. For instance, if we have a quartic extension, um, a Hochelois structure will correspond to a group of order four. And hence, the type can be either C4 or C2 times C2. These are the two isomorphism classes for groups of order four. Uh, and this was a groundbreaking result that stimulated a lot of subsequent research, but uh, nothing is perfect. The main issue is that uh, the size of the group of permutations increases rapidly with the degree of the extension. It is a factorial. Um, uh, shortly after, BIOS proved a uh, refinement which uh, allowed to focus the, the search of a, of a suitable subgroup in a smaller subgroup of the group of permutations, namely the holomorph. For a group N, the holomorph of N is defined as the semi direct product of N uh, by uh, its group of automorphisms. And this can be regarded as a subgroup of the group of permutations. Um, well, what Bios theorem states is that for a Galois degree and extension of fields with group G, instead of uh, searching all the hot Galois structures, we will uh, focus on the ones of a specific type. So we fix N a group of order small n, the same as the degree of the extension. And there is a bijective correspondence between those Hokkaido structures on the lower key that are 
of this type of type the isomorphism in class of n, and on the other hand, the regular embeddings from G to the holomorph of n up to conjugation by out of n. What does this mean? Uh, first, well, I will start with the last part. Up to conjugation by out of n means that we consider a relation uh, of embeddings that are related by conjugation by elements. This is of equivalence, and we consider the equivalence class. So here, uh, I mean conjugacy classes of regular embeddings. And um, what is a regular embedding? Well, a regular embedding uh, is an embedding whose image, beta of G, is a regular subgroup of the holomorph. And um, a regular subgroup of the holomorph, well, this is defined with the same idea. Uh, this uh, acts on N uh, uh, as permutations, and is regular when this action is simply transitive. Uh, and now let me uh, clarify that the same group, uh, a, a same group G can be embedded in different ways in the formal. And each of these embeddings will give rise to a different total wise structure. So if instead of regular embeddings, we consider regular subgroups, the correspondence is not bijective anymore. It is surjective. Uh, and um, but to determine the inverse image of each regular sample, we calculate all the regular embeddings. Um, on the other hand, uh, for a skew basis, for a finite group N, we may wonder how many isomorphism classes of skew braces with a group N are there. Rather than skew braces themselves, we are interested in isomorphism classes. Two skew braces are isomorphic if there is some bijective map between them, preserving both additive and multiplicative group structures. This is a morphism of skew braces that is bijective, an isomorphism of skew braces. Um, it was proved by Bachiller for braces in 2016 and by Guarnieri and Mendramin one year later for skew braces in general, that if N and G are finite groups of the same order, we have a bijective correspondence between these two things. On the one hand, we have skew braces with additive group N and multiplicative group G, well, isomorphism classes. And on the other hand, conjugacy classes of regular subgroups of all of N isomorphic to G of the following. So uh, we see that skew braces correspond to classes of regular subgroups. And what the researchers in the community realize and what Bachiller uh, realized, the first one, is that we have the same as in the correspondence with Pokalwa structures. Look, we have uh, seen that for, for N and G groups of the same order, the Pokalwa structures of type N on a Galois extension with group G correspond to classes of regular subgroups of the holomorph of N isomorphic to G. And on the other hand, that the classes of skew braces with halitic group and a multiplicative group G cor correspond to exactly the same set. The first of these correspondence, I don't know if I said it correctly, is surjective. Recall, we are considering regular subgroups instead of regular embeddings. Then joining these two correspondences, we obtain a surjective correspondence from the Hokkawa structures of type N to the skew braces with additive uh, group N. Well, here I, om I omit the Gs. And um, in order to find the skew braces that are mapped, sorry, the Hokkawa structures that are mapped to each skew brace, well, we consider the corresponding regular subgroup. Here, the correspondence is bijective. This regular subgroup might be maybe embedded uh, by means uh, by different ways, by means of different regular embeddings on the polymer, and then each of these embeddings correspond to a Hokkawa structure. These are all the local structures of the inverse image. So the main idea is that by counting regular subgroups or regular embeddings of the polymers, we can count both local structures and skew bases. And there are uh, a lot of works exploiting this connection. And just to say some, uh, for instance, if P is a prime number, there is a work uh, by Zenuth. Uh, Counting Hokkawa structures and skew braces of order p to the three was a PhD thesis. Also, we have 
square pre-order, uh, for the degree p to the square q, uh, p to the four, uh, and well, I have a joint work with Crespo, Rio, and Bella, uh, counting braces with a million additive group of signs, uh, the, uh, an integer multiple of a prime number p, where p is so prime with n. Uh, but in addition uh, uh, to counting results, this connection has given rise also to qualitative results on both areas. Um, particularly in focal structures, I wanted to uh, show this recent re result by Stefanello and Trapeniers, which, which is a reformulation of Greta Paradis theorem. For L over K, a Galois extension with group G circle, there is a bijective correspondence between the Hopkins structures on L over K and the group operations star on the set G such that G star circle is a skew brace. Um, this way we can get a bijective correspondence depending on the uh, skew braces. Um, and up to this point, well, to, to end, let me say that uh, Greta Paradis theorem can be formulated, as I said, for separable extensions, regardless of they are Galois or not. Uh, but the correspondence with the skew braces re uh, restricts to Galois structures on Galois extensions. There is a recent work by Martin Lyons and Truman introducing what they call skew brace points. These are Generalize uh, these are uh, generalization of uh, skew braces so that they correspond to Hopkins structures on separable extensions, regardless of they are allowed or not. And um, um, they have uh, uh, succeeded in generalizing Stefanello and Grappenier's result to this setting. Um, well, this is all I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. And now it's one for questions. We can have some questions about Can you give an can you give an example of a speed race thing with usual operations? I don't know something that you can make new but okay, so I'm thinking with some the direct there. Um, you have to give uh, a similar product of the similar product, and you consider that your one operation is the direct product, and the other operation is the okay. direct, then you have the, the star and the circle. Uh -huh. and then you work. Okay. Yeah, one of them by components, yeah. and the other one, uh, the, uh, the structure of the semi direct product. Okay, I, I don't know what this is going to do. Uh, well, so you have, um, let us say, well, I, I will probably use this notation for uh, semi direct products for context. Um, yeah, here this depends on a some file which goes, if I'm not wrong, from uh, J, J time to the automorphisms. Of G, of the sorry. And then, uh, multiply, we say, let's say, A prime, B prime. Then you have A, and now you take the image of the second component of the first one and evaluate it in the first component of the second one. And in the other component, you take the image of the product. And um, yeah, this would be the circle, and the star would be just the usual product by components. Does this make sense? Dark book and uh, theory of finite fields or the group extension of finite fields. So to say, uh, what's the big, uh, what's the big differences between you said that uh, if you have a separable case, but 
it, it seems to me that you only apply that for relatively number of extensions. So in this case, for example, the kind of field or the finite function field. Uh, here we are out of the separable world. No? Okay. Um, what what I know, well, initially, uh, Okawa theory was introduced in order to study uh, non-separable extensions. Uh, you may you may see that the, uh, I stated the definition just for a finite extension. Um, and so the perhaps the first words on Okawa theory are um, inseparable extension theory, inseparable. But I I don't know anything about it. Um, what happened is that after Gai uh, Kaparaitis was solved, it focused on separable extensions. And what do you have? So... No, I don't know anything about them. <laughs> it's, it's like another world, it's like a function field. And, and so, in this case, uh, you have. So, the, the nice thing in the, on the main thing in the separable field is that you already have the language. So you, you you play with this and then you are able to go to the um, group theory world. But on the other things, I don't know. So it's completely the techniques are completely different. No algebra, right, no more like the thousand things. Mm -hmm. So there's no more questions. Let's thank Daniel again.